I want to just talk about Thomas Reed. And I'll give you his date, 1710 to 1796. Now, I'm not going to go into as much detail as I probably should, but you ought to know the name Thomas Reed for two reasons. Reason number one, he was the author, the founder of what we call Scottish common sense philosophy. Scottish common sense philosophy. Now, the reason why Reed's philosophy ought to be important to Presbyterians is because it was imported to America and it became the major philosophical system in Presbyterian centers of learning. Presbyterian scholars at Princeton, in particular, uh, taught the com uh, the s taught taught Thomas Reed's approach to the issues of epistemology for decades. This fact has been uh, this this particular matter has been made the subject of considerable study in recent years uh, by some evangelical church historians. I I think Mark Knoll of Wheaton College has done some work on this. Uh, maybe George Marsden has talked about this in some of his books. The important role that Scottish common sense philosophy is. Now, common sense philosophy faded considerably in the 20th century, but remarkably, it's making a comeback in the work of reformed thinkers like Alvin Plantinga, who now teaches at Notre Dame. Now, I don't want to go into too much detail here because I do say a lot about this particular matter in the apologetics course and also in my book Faith and Reason. But let me just sketch for you how a Thomas Reed answer to the problem of the external world would be developed. All right? Remember I said last week we had several questions that we would try to deal with the problem of the self. Who am I? What am I? We've talked about that. And then there's the problem of the external world. How can we know that it exists? How can we know that it's like the world that we perceive? Here's Thomas Reed's answer. Thomas Reed talked about what he called belief-forming mechanisms. That's not exactly his terminology, but that's a pretty accurate name for what he had in mind. belief forming mechanisms. Now, in, an indirect, in a roundabout way, in a funny kind of way, I can see some connections between these belief-forming mechanisms and Kant's categories of the understanding. What Reed, what Reed wanted us to realize is this. Whenever you and I have experiences... Uh, we, our minds, are structured in such a way that we automatically and immediately form certain beliefs upon being perceived to in certain ways. In other words, when I perceive this piano, and remember, everything that I perceive about the piano is an idea in my mind, and so I have perceptions of touch and I have perceptions of sight and sound. I won't subject you to my magnificent piano playing. But, Reed said, in the presence of those ideas, we naturally, we necessarily find ourselves believing that the piano really exists. In other words, believing in the external world is the most natural thing for us. It's unnatural for us to believe otherwise. For you to doubt that the world outside your mind exists is to go against nature. It's to go against the way you're made. It's to go against your belief-forming mechanisms. But now, even though there's this vague similarity between belief-forming mechanisms and Kant's categories, and they're not really the same. 
Reed asked the question that Kant refused to ask. Why do all human beings have the same belief-forming mechanisms? And Reed's answer was, because God made us that way. It doesn't matter whether you're an American in Cleveland, Ohio, or an Eskimo somewhere in Alaska, or um, uh, an aborigine in the middle of Australia, all human beings exhibit the same belief-forming mechanisms. And Reed's answer is, that's because God made us that way. Now, I'm not going to pursue this matter any further. I, I, maybe someday, maybe many of you will be taking the apologetics course next year. Maybe some of you have already taken it. You've read the book Faith and Reason. I think this is an extremely interesting view to pursue. In fact, it now functions as the foundation of a whole new school of epistemology called Reformed Epistemology. This is a, this is a good school to exhibit some interest in Reformed Epistemology, all right? But it's really a kind of revival of the common sense philosophy that was so important to Presbyterians 150 years ago or more. So there's, there's lots of interesting connections here that I, that I wish we could pursue further and I hope that you all will pursue on your own. Anybody else before we break? Yes. Reformed epistemology, what it sounds like. Uh, is that a good thing? Uh, <laughs> is Reformed epistemology a good thing? I'm a Reformed epistemologist. Uh, the apologetics, the apologetics that we teach here, if, if I teach it and we, you know, and we use my book Faith and Reason, it will, it will certainly presuppose Reformed epistemology. So you bet your life it's a good thing. Can't get any better than that. <laughs> All right, we're going to break.